Jones. I think they're leaving until Saturday. We can make it work. We can make it work. Just just call me in the morning. Okay, you got it. I know how that goes. Trust me. I'm the same way. All right, everybody. Good morning. It is good to see all of you. All right, we're about to get, we're going to go ahead and get started with, with class this morning. Um, before we get started, though, I'd like to pray. And um, if you guys would just join me, let's ask God to be with us this morning. Lord, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for your word and the hope that it gives us, the instruction that it gives us, Lord, the inspiration that it gives us. I pray that you bless us this morning as we look at your word. Help us to grow as a result of being here this morning and help us to learn what it is that you have for us to learn. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, so this morning we are going to be in Mark chapter 1. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be Mark chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 21. So last week um, we took a look at the beginnings of Jesus' earthly ministry. And today, in today's lessons, we're going to see how Jesus revealed his power early on, how he revealed his purpose and stayed committed to that purpose, and how he uh, displayed his passion for people. And those are all things that we need to know this morning as followers of Christ. We need to see all of those things. And in this one passage, we get all of it. So uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 21 through 28. Let's start there. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to preach. The people were amazed at his teaching. Now pay attention to that. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue, pay attention to this too. This is pretty interesting. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus, uh, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. So, as we just said, in this passage, Jesus reveals his power, and he revealed it two ways. He revealed his power through his teaching, and he revealed his power through being able to um, heal people of demon possession or cast out demons. Um, now, the first thing that I really want to point out about this passage, and I, and I told you to pay attention to it, was that the people who were listening to Jesus were amazed or they were astonished at his teaching. Now, the word that Mark uses here for amazed or astonished means to be struck out of oneself. Okay, that's an interesting word to use. We would say it this way, the people were blown away. So a lot of times whenever, you know these new, um, when you're texting, at least when you're using an iPhone, when you're texting and you've got these emojis that are supposed to look like you, right? You're supposed to, well, some of you know this. But anyway, um, or, or they've got these little pre-made emojis and you can send a picture, you know, an emoji of, you know, your mind being blown, right? That's, these people's minds were blown when they heard Jesus. He, he just blew their minds, okay? That's the first thing that we need to be paying attention to. The second thing that we need to talk about is why Jesus' teaching blew their minds. Jesus' teaching was riveting 
and it was powerful. And they weren't used to that. They were used to scribes during the, uh, in the days of Jesus. The scribes didn't merely, merely copy things down, but they aided um, the people's understanding of scriptural principles by teaching and interpreting the law. But the way they did it was, was a little bit different than, was a lot different than the way Jesus did it. They didn't use their own, so, uh, their own opinion solely, okay? So when they were teaching, they didn't teach, you know, using their own words all the time. They would say, um, well, this person believes, or that person says. And so when they taught, that's what they, they would teach other people's teaching. And they would try to share. It's kind of like going into a, um, a lot of times when you go into a college class, um, you know, they're, they're, they'll teach you principles that somebody else came up with a lot of times. But Jesus didn't do that. Jesus taught as one who had authority. And so I was trying to think about a good illustration for this. And the best one I can think of is the candy bucket in my office. So in my office, those of you who've ever been to my office, you know that I have a candy bucket sitting there. And it's, this candy bucket is for clients when they come to visit us. Now, it has mints in it, and it has an assortment of candy bars in it. And if you were to walk into my office and not be a client, you would walk in there, and let's just say you wanted a little piece of candy. You might look at it, might kind of ease towards it, right? And then you might kind of take one, sheepish, sheepishly take one. Or you might... Um, you might ask for one and say, hey, do, do you mind if I have a piece of candy? I've had people ask me that. I'm like, oh, come on, go ahead. Go ahead, take one. But when Mason walks in, Mason's my son. When Mason walks in, he goes straight to the candy bucket, and he starts digging for Twix. I mean, you go in there, he is digging. He doesn't ask, right? He just gets right in there. Now, if you were to walk in and see him, you would know something's different. You would know he's either rude or he's got a special connection that you don't have, right? And you would say, this guy must be this, this kid must be this guy's son, right? Jesus spoke with such authority that everybody recognized him being different. Everybody who heard him said, oh, that's different. And though the people didn't really recognize it at that time, they should have. They just knew he was different, but they should have known something special was going on. So Jesus also revealed his power by casting a demon out of a man. Now, before we dive deeper into that, I want to point out something that I thought was very interesting. Do you find it fascinating that the people had a demon-possessed man worshiping with them? I mean, think about that. I've just kind of glossed over that before whenever I've been reading the scripture. You know, you read the scripture sometime and you're just reading. But think about that. Think, imagine somebody worshiping with us, with us this morning who was demon possessed. They apparently were familiar with this person. And what's interesting to me is that demon possessed man or that demon inside of that man apparently didn't feel like there was any inconsistency there. He could be demon-possessed and still be with God's people. And I wonder in our fellowship, I wonder how much encouragement, are we so focused on God that if a demon-possessed man was in our midst, would he feel uncomfortable? Would, would, the, demon, would the demon not allow that person to be here? I, I don't know. I just think it was interesting. That's just something I want to point out. So Jesus' power is greater than that of the demons and every other creature, and the people figured that out. So in Jesus' day, what would happen is when there was a demon-possessed person and they knew that you know, somebody was demon-possessed, they would try to urge the demons out of the people by referring to the power of, of one or multiple gods while using magical words and rituals. Now, one of my favorite examples of this is found in Acts chapter 19. So Acts chapter 19, um, let's look at verse 13. Um, 
Acts chapter 19, verse 13. This is, I, I laugh at this story every time I read it. And it's not funny, but it's funny. It's kind of one of those things when you see somebody fall and you want to laugh, but you want to make sure they're okay first. And then when they're okay, you start laughing and you can't quit laughing. Okay. So some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. Listen to this. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. So I don't even know who this guy is, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invoke his name in order to drive out this spirit. Now listen to this. This is hilarious. Seven, scun, seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them. Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now, I think that's funny. It probably wasn't funny at the time to those guys. But I think that's funny. That's what people would do during the time of Jesus. Is they would invoke the name of, of you know, a God, of God or some other gods to try to urge these spirits out. And Jesus doesn't do that. Here in Mark chapter 1, we see that the spirit sees Jesus and he reaches out to Jesus and says, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Are you, have you come to destroy us? And then Jesus says, be quiet. Now, I think that's interesting, too, why Jesus tells him to be quiet. I mean, what, why? Why tell him to be quiet? Why not let the evil spirit um, go ahead and, and, and uh, you know, point out who Jesus was? I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is this is this story leaves no doubt about Jesus' ability to dominate demons and crush Satan's strongholds that hold people captive. Over and over again in Scripture, Jesus showed his power no matter our problem. Jesus is greater than any problem that you've got. Jesus showed power over the forces, spiritual forces of evil, just like we saw right here, showed power over this demon. Do you remember the story in Mark chapter 19, verses 17 through 27? Um, that's the story when the father of a son who had a son who was demon-possessed, he brings the son to Jesus to be healed. Remember that? And, um, and then the disciples meet the father first, and they asked, uh, you know, they asked, he asked the disciples if, if uh, they can help him. And they try to, and remember, it doesn't work. And so, all of a sudden, let's go there. Mark chapter 9. I, I want you to see this. This is amazing. Mark chapter 9, verse 17. So, um, right here, let's see. Okay. Verse 17. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Skipping down to verse 20. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into, a, into fire or water to kill him. Listen to this. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. I love Jesus' response here. I love Jesus' response here. If you can. If you can. Everything is possible for him who believes. I love this. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I love this. Jesus had the power over evil spirits, over evil forces. Jesus showed power over our circumstances. Remember his first miracle? In uh, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, 
Jesus turned water into wine in order to help a wedding feast that was in trouble. Remember, they ran out of wine. Jesus' mother comes to him, and he turns water into wine. Now, while that may seem insignificant to you, I'm sure it was quite significant to the bride and the groom and their families. So the next time our circumstances or your circumstances have you reeling, remember that Jesus has power over our circumstances. I wonder how often we miss out on God's goodness because we're impatient or because we fail to bring our issues to Jesus. Jesus showed power over disease. Remember the bleeding woman um, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 18? Remember this lady had been sick. She'd been bleeding for 12 years. And she thought, you know what? If I could just touch Jesus' robe, robe I, I'll be well. And so remember, she goes and gets in Jesus' wherever Jesus was. And as Jesus is passing by, he's surrounded by people. And she touches the fringe of his robe. And he stops and he turns around. Like, who touched me? What do you mean, who touched you? Do you see how many people are around here? And he looks at her and he says, your faith has made you well. Jesus has power over our disease. Jesus showed power over death. In the same passage, remember, Jesus was on his way to raise the synagogue ruler's daughter who had just died. Remember when Jesus got there, upon entering the house, remember they were playing uh, noisy funeral music. Jesus said, she's not dead, she's sleeping. And remember, all the people laughed at him. Let's just say they didn't laugh too long. Jesus showed his power over nature. Remember in Matthew chapter 8, we find Jesus in a boat with his disciples. A fierce storm comes on the lake, and the waves are breaking into the boat. And what's Jesus doing? He's sleeping. How? I don't know. I mean, I sleep pretty hard, but I don't sleep that hard. And remember, they come to Jesus. All the disciples come to Jesus, and they say, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Now, this is really important. I think this is, this is really, really important. There were a few of those guys that were fishermen that were on that boat. And they were scared to death that they were going to drown. So that must have been a pretty bad storm. And so Jesus wakes up, and what does he do? He tells the wind and the waves to be still and to be quiet. And remember what the disciples were responsible for? Wow. This guy is something else. Jesus showed his power over demons, over disease, and over death. He showed his power over seemingly insignificant situations and those that were definitely life and death. Knowing that, do you think he can handle what's going on in your life? I know he can. It was... It was uh, all we have to do is, is ask him to. I have uh, one of my favorite quotes on prayer is from Corey Ten Boom. She said one time, is prayer your steering wheel or is it your spare tire? It needs to become our steering wheel. Whenever we're faced with a difficult situation, whenever we're faced with you know, what do we do, God? It, it, or what, what are we going to do? We need to go to God first and have him direct us because Jesus shows us that he has the power to work in our lives. So why do you think, a little crowd participation here, please. Why do you think that we're so prone to miss God's work in our lives? Okay, we're not looking for it. Okay, excellent. We're not looking for it. Okay, we can do it ourselves. So think about this in your own life. Whenever you have a problem arise, what's your first thought? Is your first thought, man, I need to pray about this? Or is your first thought, okay, I got to figure, I got to line this up, and what am I going to do? Right? Okay, very good. Yes, yes, Steve.
Yeah. Steve was saying that a lot of times we just wait um, when we know we can't handle something or, or when we get so far down the line that we know that, you know, we're not going to be able to handle it. And then we just, we use, we use God as kind of like a magic pill or, or even like a, um, even like a trump card. Okay, here's my trump card. I'm going to lay it down and now I'm going to. Now I'm going to be able to get out of this situation. He's kind of a last resort. Just a second, Riley, I'll come to you. Yeah, Terry? Oh, it's a lack of faith. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great, um, it's a lack of faith. I think it's a lack of faith of sometimes it's two, two, two ways we lack faith, right? Um, one way is, Will God even be able to do anything sometimes, right? And then sometimes it's, will God want to do anything? I mean, this is such a small situation. Does God even care about this, right? What were you going to say, Riley? My optic. Sometimes we have preconceived notions about what God will do and what God is, is going to do. And we don't, we don't look for what God can do in a situation. That's a, that's a great point. And we just have blinders on. I like that. Sometimes we have blinders on. We think, well, God won't do that. God won't care about that. But we see through Scripture over and over again that Jesus cares about everything. He cares about the insignificant. He cares about the significant. He cares about death. He cares about disease. He cares about hurt. He cares about people. We're going to talk about that in just a second. I've got to get to that point here in a second. I like, um, and I, I've, I've shared this with you guys before, but when we talk about prayer, um, I like this. The Archbishop uh, William Temple once said, when I pray, coincidence, coincidences happen. And when I don't, they don't. Just remember that. When I pray, coincidences happen, and when I don't, they don't. So it's not just coincidence. You've got to be looking for God to be working, or you'll miss it sometimes. All right, so now that we know that Jesus has power, and, and, and he shows that and reveals that in our lives, what does he require of us? We're just going to hit this real quick. Um, remember when Jesus was leaving earth, in Matthew chapter 28, in verse 18, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, he tells his disciples this, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God has a purpose for us. And that is for us to share this message of good news. We serve a powerful God, and we're about to find out that, we've, that we serve a, a passionate God, a God who's passionate for us. But we'll get to that in just a second. Now I'm going to fly through this next point, okay? So the next thing that we need to see, in the, or the next thing that we see in this passage, Mark chapter 1, verse 35 through 38, we see Jesus' purpose. Very early in the morning while it was still dark. So this is right after all of this stuff has happened. Um, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. In essence, everyone is looking for you to heal some more folks. 
Everyone is looking for you to show some more power. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. Listen to this. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Have you ever had a time or has there ever been a time in your life when your intentions were questioned? I've been there. Well, if you've been there, you're in good company because Jesus' miracles um, were not supposed to be an end, uh, an end in and of themselves. They were supposed to be a way for Jesus to share um, the message of him being the Son of God. Jesus cared about people. And Jesus, you know, had genuine love for those that he was healing. But the miracles were supposed to assist him in preaching the good news to the nations that he's the son of God. And that salvation comes through him. Jesus knew the purpose of his ministry, but the people around him often misunderstood it. Both the people of Capernaum and Jesus' own disciples got caught up in, in Jesus' rising fame and miraculous healings and were unable, they were just unable to see the purpose behind it all. All too often we do the same thing, don't we? We get focused on the how and forget the why. You know, why are we supposed to be doing what we're supposed to be doing? We focus so much on the how. How is... You know, so many times we focus on, on programs and we focus on projects instead of focusing on sharing the good news of God's grace and his mercy and his reconciliation. You do that in your family too, don't you? Sometimes. Sometimes you get so focused on your activities that are intended to enhance your family's life and those activities become the focus of your family's life. Sometimes the thing you want your kid to do in order to help them to grow as a person becomes the focus and it becomes who they are and you push that on them, right? As parents, sometimes you do that. Sometimes you allow your child to do that as well. Just remember this, whenever you're trying to figure out how to do something, the answer to how is why. Once, you, once you're sure or once you know why you're doing something, the creativity on how to accomplish it will flow. But we've got to remember that the how can never become more important than the why. So maybe for the first time this morning, you're hearing why you were created. You were created to honor God. You were created to glorify God. You're going to be your best self whenever you are living for God. And if you don't believe me, just try it. Maybe for the first time you're recognizing, okay, this is why I was created. Mark Twain once said this, the two most important days in life are the day you're born and the day you figure out why. I love the words of, uh, I love the words of Eric Thomas on this topic as well. He said, when you find out your why, you don't hit the snooze anymore. You, found out a, you find out a way to make it happen. So we, or the disciples, longed to relish in Jesus' miracles. They wanted to stay there, and they wanted Jesus to spend all day, every day, healing people and showing his power. And Jesus didn't want to leave the, the world wondering what his purpose was. So he declared with clarity that he had come to tell people about him. He had come to share the message of salvation, the message of hope, the message of restoration. Now, it's worth noting, I think here, it's worth noting that Jesus retreated alone to be with his father and that prayer was essential to that. Now, as I was reading this, I just wondered, was Jesus tempted? Do you think Jesus was tempted to enjoy the fame that he was experiencing and continue to perform miracles for the crowd? Do you think Jesus may have been tempted? Sure. I think it's totally reasonable for us to assume that that was a temptation for Jesus. You, you know how I know that? Do you remember one of Jesus' temptations by Satan whenever he was in the wilderness? It was, look, listen, 
I'll give you all this stuff if you'll just bow down and worship me. Right? You know? I, just, just, you know, I, I'll, I'll do it all. That was, that was one of Jesus' temptations. And so how did he overcome that? He overcame it with prayer. So real quick, what are some ways that you get away and recalibrate so that you can focus on what it is God wants you to do? You work in the yard, okay. Hey, if you get tired of working in yours, come work in mine. Okay, so you work in the yard. Okay, so you get out and enjoy nature, and it's a way for you to be close to God. Okay, that's awesome. Great. What about anybody else? Okay. Okay, so you like to see things grow, and that's like connection, okay, that you have with God. Okay, awesome. You know, one thing that I try to do in the mornings um, before I get my day started is I try to pray, and I try to spend a lot of time with God just praying about the things that are heaviest on my heart. And, yeah, I feel like it gives me the strength to go through the rest of the day. But prayer was a way that Jesus was able to recalibrate. And we need to make sure that we have a way to do the same thing, that we recalibrate and refocus our heart on our God-given purpose. We have to remember our why. And we've got to have mechanisms in place, whether it's prayer, whether it's solitude, whether it's getting outside, whether it's fellowship, whether it's connections, that will keep us on track. All right, finally, and this is... This is super important, so this will be the last point. Um, In this passage, we also see Jesus' passion for people, and this is important for us. So uh, verse 40, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, listen to this, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man, I'm willing. He said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cured. So, so far we've talked about Jesus revealing his power and revealing his purpose. Now, it would have been really easy for Jesus to kind of become a machine, right? Okay, I've only got a limited amount of time on earth. This is, you know, I'm using my power to reveal my purpose to people so that they can be saved. And he could have just become a machine and become solely focused on that. But what we see here is that Jesus has a passion for people. And this is important for us because we all need to know that God cares for us. God hears you when you pray. God sees you when you hurt. And God gives you his power if you'll let him, if you'll reach out to him. You know, 11 years ago, my family moved back to Dothan so so I could start my business. And in those early days, there were a lot of six-day weeks and there were a lot of 60 to 80-hour weeks. And there was a lot of times that I was present with my family, but I wasn't present, if that makes sense. Because I was thinking about how I could work on this or how I could tweak that and what I could do to make that better with my business. And it would have been, as I look at this story, it would have been easy for Jesus to do the same thing. But he didn't because Jesus had a passion for people and God does too. So what Jesus does that's amazing here is here's this guy with leprosy. Nobody wanted to even be close to lepers. Remember, lepers had to cry out to everybody if they were coming in their general vicinity. Hey, I'm unclean. Stay away from me. I'm unclean. And what did Jesus do? Jesus, this man comes to Jesus and falls before him. He says, you know what? If you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus, instead of saying, yeah, that's good, go for it. You know, we're tempted to do that sometimes, you know, in our community, right? Hey, when there's a problem, we're tempted to maybe throw money at it. Maybe we're tempted to help from afar and not really get involved and not get our hands dirty, right? But what does Jesus do? Jesus gets right there in there and he, and he touches the man. And I wonder, have you ever wondered how long it had been since the man had been touched? I mean, think about that. I mean, there are times when my wife has gone out of town, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, she was out of town for a few days in Baltimore with Braylon, 
And I'm telling you, when she got home and I wrapped my arms around her, that was one of the best feelings that I, I mean, that's one of the best feelings you can have. When I hug that little girl, when I see my kids, when they come home from college and I hug them and I wrap my arms around them, I know that they just, they're like, whoa, dad, it's, you know, okay, you know? And I just wonder how this guy must have felt when Jesus said, you know what, I'm willing. And he reached out and touched him. And this is what you need to know. This is the most important thing that you need to know about this part of the passage. Is that God reaches out to you too. And he touches you wherever you are. Whenever you're struggling with sin and whenever you feel ugly. And whenever you feel like God doesn't care, he does. And whenever you've got all this junk that you're dealing with. And you feel like with these preconceived notions that God wouldn't want anything to do with you, he does. And I think sometimes we need to see passages like this because they remind us of who God is. He is powerful. And he has a purpose, and his purpose is for you to be with him forever. But the way he shows that to you and the way he shares that with you is through his passion for you. And I think as people, of, as, as the people of God, we've got to remember that. And we can't forget that when we go out and we share that message of Jesus with other people. We can't forget the passion that Jesus had for people as well. So let's get our hands dirty. Let's let Jesus fill us up and take care of us and heal us. And let's go share that with other people and not be afraid to get our hands dirty and to get down in the dirt and get down in other people's dirt and help lift them up with the love of Jesus. All right, it's time to go. Great to see y'all. Thanks for being here this morning. going to get an award this morning. Please sit up here in the reserve seating. If you have children that are getting an award this morning, please sit up here in the reserve seating. I want to welcome all our visitors. We've got quite a few people coming in right now for the Bible Memory Awards. Uh, these first five pews on both sides are reserved for Westgate Church of Christ parents that have uh, students receiving awards and also Westgate Christian School parents. So if you'll make your way in, these first five pews on each side are reserved for, for those families and those children.
really quick. We got a few people coming in. If you don't mind moving over and, and allowing people to have some room to sit, if you're okay with that, if you'll scoot closer to maybe to the inside to help people out as they come in, I'd really appreciate it. Good morning and welcome to Westgate. If you are visiting today, you are our honored guests and we are so thankful you are here. We are excited to be able to meet together and sing praises to God, take part in communion, read scripture, spend time in prayer and listen to a message inspired by God's word. What a great day to worship our God. Next Sunday, we will have a special time at the end of the indoor morning worship service to honor our senior graduates. In addition, there is a table in the gym foyer for any gifts you would like to drop off. The table will remain there until May 22nd. Please be sure to keep these students and their families in your prayers as they venture out on their new journeys and pray that God will guide them and use them to spread His word to others. This year's VBS will be bigger and better than ever. We need lots of Christmas trees for decorations and large refrigerator or washer dryer type boxes. If you have these items or can volunteer to help during VBS, please let Allison know as soon as possible. The dates for VBS this year are June 13th through 16th. Mark these days on your calendar and start inviting your friends. We have an incredible opportunity to participate in Mother's Day May. There is a baby crib in the tiled foyer in which you can place baby wipes, baby lotion, diapers, or any other items for newborn babies and their parents. These items will be donated to Wiregrass Hope Group at the end of the month. Antoine Joseph was blessed as a talented musician. His musical career was short-lived, however, but his foundation in music allowed him to begin creating instruments instead of playing them in concert halls. Most of his creations were not well received in his time, and some musicians went so far as to say they would never play anything made by him. Antoine Joseph never wavered, however, and his foundation in music convinced him to hold to his belief in his invention. One of the most instantly recognizable instruments today, the one that bears the name of Antoine Joseph Sax, the saxophone. In Matthew 7, Jesus tells us that everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Foundations are incredibly important in inventions, in architecture, in business, and especially in our spiritual lives. If we have an immovable and unshakable spiritual foundation based on the word of God, we will be able to lean on him and his word through the struggles and hardships of life, and we will remember to praise him for his goodness in the good times. A strong foundational groundwork is being laid here at Westgate for our children, and we hope that continues in the home as well. There are children from our church and Westgate Christian School who have worked extremely hard to memorize and recite scripture, and they will be presented with awards this morning for their incredible accomplishments. Our prayer is that these words of life will have a lifelong impact in their lives and that the word of God will sink deep into their hearts and give them a firm foundation for the future. We are so proud of these children. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God 
prepare beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10 And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Romans 8.28 Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Proverbs 3.5 Be strong and courageous. Do not fear of the Lord of God. The Lord God will go with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Deuteronomy 31 says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 1. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and who believes in him? in him that you should not perish but have eternal life. John 3 16. Jeremiah 29 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil. They give you a future and a hope. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. James 1.22 Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Proverbs 16.3 All things were made. Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First Kings, Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Joseph, Prophets, Isaiah, Solomon, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Tyson, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Jonah, and Zebediah, And the last is Malachi. There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a, w a false witness that breathes out lies, and, and one that sows discord among brothers. Proverbs 6, 16, 19. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. How awesome was that? Unbelievable. I feel like uh, I'm letting you down by standing up here after that. It's hard to follow that right there. But I want to welcome you to our Bible Memory Challenge Awards Day here at Westgate Church of Christ. We have a special treat today. We are joined by parents, students, and teachers from Westgate Christian School. The kids here at Westgate Church of Christ and the kids at Westgate Christian School have worked so hard this last year. You saw a small sample of what they all had to learn. They memorize scripture each month. Some memorize facts that pertain to scripture. And today we're going to celebrate that effort and that blessing. And what we're trying to accomplish here as a church and also as a school is we want to put God's word into the minds of our children. We want it to go from their minds to their heart. From their heart, we want it to go into their actions. We want them one day to grow up and be mature followers of Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. I'm blown away when I hear all the news of the hard work I just want to share this with you because this really got my attention. There were two classes at Westgate Christian School. The entire class won the Bible Memory Challenge. That is amazing when you think about it. Entire classes. Um, 
when I think of the blessing of the school, we had a baptism at school the other day. I mean, how many times do you hear about a baptism at school? How awesome is that? But we are so blessed. I want to say thank you to the parents of our, our, our church members, our children here that have worked with our kids so much. Our Bible class teachers on Sunday and Wednesday and all the hard work they've done. Our school teachers and administrators here at Westgate Christian School. And I want to say thank you to Allison. You've done such a good job with these kids, and I appreciate it. So at this time, if you are receiving an award, I want you to stand up and move to the outside up against uh, the bricks there, if you will. If you're receiving an award, you can go in and start moving that way now. I just want to say a few things for decorum's sake, so we'll have time to get through this. If you'll hold your applause till we get all the kids announced that have received that specific award, and then I'll let you know, I'll present them to you at that point. But what they're going to do is receive their award. They're going to come up here and join me up here. So once we get all the kids up here, we're going to give them a round of applause. So if you'll wait to that moment, that will help us uh, with time's sake, and so each kid can uh, receive proper recognition. But the first award we're going to give this morning is for the Bible Memory Challenge for three years old all the way through third grade. These kids had to memorize Bible verses each month and recite them to Allison, so they worked very hard. So as I call your name, please come and receive your reward. Uh, Addie Reese Harden, Annalise Hatcher, Riley Mitchell, Braylon Sanders, Liam Sandler, Braylon Wakefield, Harper May Harden, Harper May, Aubrey Small. Henry Watley, Aria Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our Bible Memory Challenge, three-year-old through third grade. The next set of awards that I'm giving is the Bible Memory Challenge Elite. This is three years old through kindergarten. Now these kids memorized the same verses, but also had to memorize other facts of scripture like the 12 apostles, the books of the Bible, the Lord's Prayer and things like that. So as I say your name, please come forward. Emma Adams. Dawson Arnold. Wellesley Arnold, Charlie Buckland, Benton Eldridge, Adeline Flat. Sutton Haley, Lila Hatcher, Abelina Hilson. Tinley Karasev,
Grady Kennedy. Hattie Kennedy. Cooper Mitchell. Juliana Palmer. L. Pierce. Kenna Pines. Griffin Sandler. Adeline Skipper. Tinley Snellgrove. Austin Turner. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our Bible Memory Challenge Elite, three-year-old through kindergarten. Next, we have our Bible Memory Challenge Elite, first through third grade. As I call your name, please come and get your award. Alexa Allen. Camden Burroughs. Grayson Flat. Presley Greathouse. Millie Kennedy. Audrey McCullough. Alexander Murphy. Troy Powell. Ellison Rogers. Kendra Scott. And Kendra was recently baptized into Christ, too. Thomas Watley. Caden White. Ladies and gentlemen, our Bible Memory Challenge Elite, first through third grade. Good job, kiddos. Good job, guys. Now we're going to recognize our older kids' Bible Memory Challenge Elite. This is fourth through fifth grade. As I call your name, please come forward. Emma Eldridge. Shaylee Greathouse, Bryson Johnson, Anna.
Anna Grace Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, our Bible Memory Challenge Elite, fourth through fifth grade. There's one other group I want to recognize due to COVID. We didn't get a chance to do this. This last summer, we had an A to Z Bible verse challenge. Now, what that meant was kids memorized 26 passages. And the difference in this one is they had to say them all at the same time. So imagine that, 26 verses without a break. You had to say them all consecutively to get this award. So we had two kids get this award. So as I say your name, please come forward. Anna Grace Jones. Alexander Murphy, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, our A to Z Bible Verse Challenge Award. This concludes our awards uh, ceremony. Thank you so much for being patient, but this is so important. We wanted the whole church to be a part of this. Good morning. It is a good day to be here together, see so many faces and to celebrate uh, these kids. Let's stand together now and join in responsive reading as we worship God this morning. Let us worship the eternal God, the source of love and life who created us. Let us worship Jesus Christ, the risen one who lived among us. Let us worship the Spirit, the holy fire who renews us. And to the one true God be praised in all times and places through the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's sing together. <coughs> Father, we love.
being who you are, for doing what you do, for loving us, for providing for us, for caring of us, for carrying us through things in our lives, for being there with us, walking before us, walking beside us, walking behind us. God, for the times that we choose to go our own way, thank you for being there when we realize that we are nothing without you and welcoming us back, loving us unconditionally. Thank you, God, for this time to be together this morning, to, to not only be encouraged by each other, but ultimately to worship you and you alone. Father, we pray that everything we have said and done, from the songs that are sung, the prayers that are offered, the message that we will hear from your word, and of course the blessing to take communion together this morning, we pray that everything would be honoring and glorifying to you, acceptable in your sight. We love you, God. And again, we thank you for all that we have. We know that everything we have comes from you, and without you, we have nothing and are nothing. And so we praise you. It's just in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you are comfortable remaining standing, uh, let's stand and sing communion. If not, you can sit down. That's okay. But next we get to take communion together as a church body. So uh, let's sing together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Passover with his apostles before his sufferings began. We know it's important to Jesus, for he revealed it directly to the apostle Paul, who was not there on the night of his betrayal. Communion is about remembrance. We remember the past, his death, burial, and resurrection. We celebrate today as we commune with our Lord and each other, and we look to the future until he comes again. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the gift of your Son. As we take this bread, we do so honoring the body that was given in our stead. In his name, amen.
Will you pray with me again? Father, thank you for the gift of salvation, for the shedding of your son's blood. Our words will never be enough to express our gratitude. So this morning, we ask you to accept our humble thank you. And again, in his name. Scripture teaches us that God is love. John 3.16 teaches us that love gives. Whether it be our time or money or be an encouraging word, we can all be the givers God wants us to be. The world asks, how much does a person own? How much money do they have? Christ asks, how do they use those blessings? Let us pray again. Father, as we give back a portion of that which is already yours, we thank you. You've blessed us beyond measure, and this we will all be eternally grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. It's kind of funny when you all sat down, I heard all this, oh. So you can just stay seated for this song, okay? <laughs> Let's sing together before we have our message this morning. The Lord reigns, he is a mighty God, the Lord God reigns. The Lord reigns, he is a mighty God, the Lord God reigns. And great is the Lord Almighty, he is Lord, he is God indeed. Great is the Lord Almighty. chapter 2, start at verses 1 through 12. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And as he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, 
they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But, they, but that they may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and immediately picking up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Let us pray. In the name of Jesus, we are so grateful for this day, dear Father, that you have awakened us to, dear Lord. We're grateful unto our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he shed his blood on our lives, that we may be assembled together in fellowship in your presence. Dear Lord, we thank you not only for this day, but we thank you for these children, dear Father. We ask and pray that you continually bless these children, dear Father. Bless their parents, dear Father, that they may continually strive to know you, dear Father. These children, dear Father, they sacrifice their will, their minds, and their attention, dear Father, to memorize your word. And I pray, dear Father, that your word will continue to grow within them, dear Lord and that their parents, dear Father, may be strengthened by, the, by their children, dear Father, to encourage them to continue to seek you, dear Father. For it's in you, dear Father, that we seek first, dear Father. So it's in that, dear Lord, we say thank you for the children and for their parents, dear Father. Continue to bless them as only you can, dear Lord. We thank you for the school here and all of the, the staff here at, at, uh, at Westgate, dear Lord. We ask and pray that you continually encourage them, dear Father. Strengthen them, dear Lord, that they may continue, dear Father, to pour their lives out for these children, dear Lord. For they are the next generation in you, dear Lord. So we thank you for the children, the parents, and the faculty here at this church, dear Lord. We pray, dear Father, for this house, dear Father, for the pastor, for the shepherds, for the leadership of this house, dear Lord. That they may continue to seek you in all that they do, dear Father, as we grow together as a family, dear Father. And I bless each member here, dear Lord. We bless them, dear Father, in your healing, dear Father. We ask and pray that your forgiveness continually be upon them, dear Father, and that the power of your word, dear Lord, may lead us, dear Father, into your will and your purpose, dear Father. It's in these things, dear Father, we pray, dear Father. So it's in that, dear Lord, we say thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I always have to come up here after the kids recite the passages and after Jason's reading. Um, Jason, I, I felt like I was in that house in Capernaum there for a minute. Could y'all relate to that? I felt like I was there. A powerful reading. Thank you for the prayers. And, and also, we have a lot of visitors here, and we're thankful. We have some special, I don't know if we're going to call them visitors, but Monty and Deborah are back with us, and it is wonderful to see you. How it makes our heart glad to have you guys at Westgate back home. We're thankful for that. There's a little boy that was afraid of the dark. He was terrified of the dark, and his mother wanted him to go out on the back porch and get the broom for her. Well, it was nighttime. He's terrified. He told his mom, he said, Mama, I'm afraid of the dark. I don't want to go out there. The mother's trying to encourage the little boy. She says, Son, Jesus is everywhere. He will watch over you. The little boy thought for a minute and reasoned. He said, Mama, is Jesus on the back porch? 
She said, yes, he's on the back porch, even there. So the little boy walked to the back door. He opened, he looked on the porch, and he said, Jesus, if you're out there, give me the broom, please. <laughs> you may feel like that about Jesus sometimes. You have a need, and you want Jesus to fulfill that need, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so today, we're going to ask a big question that I want all of you to think about. What is your greatest need today? What is your greatest need? We're doing a sermon series this year on the Gospels, on the life of Jesus. We're asking one overarching question every week. Who is Jesus? And more importantly, who is Jesus to you? And so today, we're asking this question. We're investigating who is Jesus. We're asking this question, what is your greatest need? And how does Jesus factor in to your greatest need? I want you to think about that as we go through this sermon, as we think of this story of the paralytic in Capernaum. And so today we're going to look at two types of needs, two basic types of needs. And the first is this. We come to Jesus with our felt needs, felt needs, what we feel like we need in our lives, in our hearts. And there are two groups in this story that we're going to look through their eyes and see their felt needs. We're going to look through the eyes of the crowds. Notice the crowds are so important in this story. So we're going to look through their eyes and their felt needs. We're going to look to the eyes of this paralytic man who is at the mercy of these four good friends. What is his felt need? What does he feel like he needs the most right now? Now let's go back to our reading and think of what we've heard so far. Jesus comes back home. We know Jesus was living in Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, but he moved his base of operation to Capernaum. So he's working out of Capernaum doing his ministry. So this is home to him now. More than likely, this is the house of Simon Peter. We're not sure about that, but that's what most people think. This is the house of of Peter. Jesus has become so popular in Mark's gospel. If you'll notice, Mark's gospel says immediately a lot because this thing is rolling. It's fast. So in Mark's gospel, we hear all these things that Jesus is doing, these wonderful actions. So his popularity spreads and crowds start to come. Now he's in this home doing what he loves to do, teaching the word of God. He's preaching to these people. Imagine you're there in this house and this house is packed full of folks. There are people everywhere people outside the house, people pressing against the door, layers of people. Maybe they're trying to look in through the window, and they just can't get to Jesus. They've heard about this great teacher who also can heal. But there's one guy that stands out in this story, and the guy that stands out in this story is the paralytic, the faceless crowds, and then we have this paralytic guy who has four awesome friends. You have friends like that that love you that much. They would do that for you. I mean, think about having that currents in your life, friends that care that much, they would do anything to get you to Jesus. And that's what they're all about. So they get there and the house is packed. They can't get in the front door. So in the houses of Palestine, it was interesting, they had flat roofs. And so they would have these large beams that would go across the top and they would lay thatch on top of those beams. And they would take mud and pack the mud on top and the mud would, would bake and harden and be like a type of plaster. These roofs were used for all kinds of different things. They would go up kind of like our porches and balconies to get fresh air to spend family time. Sometimes, as we see in Acts chapter 10, they go up there to pray and have quiet time with God. So these four friends decide, we're going to get our buddy to Jesus one way or the other. So they go up these stone stairs that would be beside the house. They go up the stone steps. They get to the top. They get to the roof, and they start to literally, in the Greek, dig through the roof. Now imagine you're sitting there. Jesus is teaching. The house is packed, and all of a sudden you hear something weird up in the roof. You hear scratching, and all of a sudden sunlight comes bursting through, and all of a sudden a mat descends with this paralytic man. I'm thinking Peter's thinking, who's going to fix my roof, right? How's that going to work out? But that had to be shocking. Imagine you're there and how you'd react to this whole scene. I want to take you back to our reading and and just get a, a little snippet of what's happening. Mark 2, 4 through 5. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, They removed the roof above him. When they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now crowds in the Gospel of Mark are a big deal. You're going to see this 40 different times in the Gospel of Mark, crowds. So you have these faceless crowds that are fickle about Jesus. They don't know what they think about Jesus But this guy stands out, and his friends stand out, and you saw why. Jesus says, seeing their faith, he notices there's something different about these four fellows and this paralytic. Now, they have faith that dares to do really something that would seem impossible. 
They dare to do something really that's dangerous. And we think about biblical faith. I think we've made a mistake in modern times that we have made biblical faith, like head knowledge, stuff I believe up here about Jesus, and that is important. But biblical faith is a type of faith and trust that will launch out and will do anything for the Lord. Think of Abraham and the faith he had. The book of Romans says that's what faith looks like is Abraham. What did Abraham do? God says, leave your country. He doesn't give them GPS or directions or anything like that. Abraham just goes in faith. That's the type of faith we see in Scripture. But I want you to notice the crowds. And the crowds give us this first felt need. Felt need number one. We want Jesus sometimes just to be a good advisor, don't we? We need Jesus just to be a good advisor in our life. These crowds are voyeuristic. They're there. They don't really know about Jesus yet. What can Jesus do for us? So we're kind of here on the outside looking in and asking these questions about, okay, what is Jesus going to bring to my life? And I think a lot of people in America today are in this category. They're like the crowds. They're in a lot of churches this morning, to be quite honest. They're there, and they're looking at Jesus as just another add-on to their life. Think about it this way. Some of us have trainers. Now, I don't have a trainer, but some of us have trainers, and it's good to be healthy. You want to get in shape, you want to work out, so you get someone to help you do that, so you have a trainer that helps with that aspect of your life. You've got to make some tough financial decisions. You've got to plan for the future. You've got to have retirement, so you have a financial advisor who has a very important job in your life, so you get that part of your life in place. Some people have life coaches now that help them get through and be successful in life. And some people see Jesus as just another part. Oh yeah, I've got this spiritual part of me. I need a spiritual advisor to help me get my life straight. So Jesus just becomes this kind of good advisor that comes along and helps me get through life. And I, I'm sad to say this, people that believe that have totally missed the point of who Jesus is. They have missed the point. And we get a snippet of this when Jesus says something really weird. Jesus says, sons, your sins are forgiven. Now, what's wrong with this guy? I mean, is Jesus just missing the point? Is he oblivious? This guy is dependent on these four friends. He cannot walk. He's a paralytic. He needs to be healed. He did not come there for a counseling session with Jesus. He didn't come to confess sin but Jesus says the weirdest thing, your sins are forgiven. What is wrong with Jesus in this story? Well, maybe Jesus has it right. Maybe he knows something that we don't. I want you to hold on to that thought. Why does Jesus say your sins are forgiven? We're going to come back to that in just a minute. There is a second felt need in this story. And it is the, the felt need that if Jesus will just give us that one thing, that one thing, I'll be okay. Jesus, if you can give me this one thing in my life I need so bad, I will be happy. Just one thing, Lord. Now, when I think about this guy, I'm not making light of his condition. It is horrible when you think about what he's gone through. I don't know when he was paralyzed. I don't know how it happened, but this guy is helpless. In this society, there is no social safety net to help him. He is at risk. His situation is dire. This man is desperate. I mean, imagine the desperation of his friends. They love him so much. This man wants to be healed. They want him healed so bad. They will do whatever it takes to get him healed. If I just get this one thing, I'm going to be happy. I read an article a few years ago about celebrities. It was, a, it was in a magazine. And it was tracking celebrities that started out small. Regular folks just like us. I mean, most of us in here are not going to get the desires of our heart. Now, you may have a goal in life. You may never achieve it, but a few people achieve the greatest goal of all. So there are some people out there. We can look through their eyes and learn from them. But what they say in this article is these people, maybe they started waiting tables. They were, they were working construction. They were doing all kinds of jobs trying to hit it big. And finally they make it in Hollywood, and they get all the dreams of their, their life. And pretty much to a person, all of these people have one thing in common. Once they make it big, they are miserable people. They say they're hard to be around. They're angry and miserable. And here's why. They finally get that one thing. And they realize all along it was not enough. It was not enough to fill them up. It was not enough to make them content. It was just not enough. And we start to learn really quick that the greatest need of all is Jesus. It's that simple. The greatest need is Jesus. We see it in this story. I think of Billy Joel. You know, 
I love old Billy Joel, by the way, the old Billy Joel stuff, you know, some of his older albums. And he's a very decorated artist, you know, golden records, you know, top 40 hits, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Today, you're probably going to hear a first ever Billy Joel quoted in a church service. <laughs> but I want to share with you a quote from Billy Joel that really kind of gets to the heart of what I'm talking about. I want you to hear what he had to say. Now, realize he's been successful, but his personal relationships have been a shambles. He's been through two uh, wives. He's struggled in his own personal relationships. Listen to what he says. The happiest times in my life were when my relationships were going well, but in my whole life, I haven't met the person I can sustain a relationship with. That's sad, isn't it? So I'm discontented about that. I'm angry with myself. Maybe you can relate to that. I have regrets. You don't get hugged by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And you don't have children with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I want what everyone else wants. Listen to this. To love and to be loved and to have a family. So look at the eyes of Billy Joel. He's like, I've had it all. I'm famous. I'm talented. I've got money. He's dated supermodels. You name it. But he's like, without love, it doesn't mean one thing. And I would say to Billy Joel, really what he needs is Jesus Christ. Because when you start to think about these relationships, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you have that relationship with God, those horizontal relationships start to take care of themselves, loving your neighbor as yourself. It all tends to work out with Jesus. So that takes me to the second big point, our greatest need. Jesus reveals our deepest and greatest need. We don't even realize this sometimes. We need Jesus to tell us what our greatest need is because our own hearts can play tricks on us at times. He shows us what we truly need. So when Jesus says to this paralytic, I want to come back to this. He says, your sins are forgiven. That's kind of crazy when you think about it. I mean, how many people walk around going, your sins are forgiven? You would think this person is crazy. Now you could say, like, if you hurt me or offend me, I could say to you, well, I forgive you for hurting me. But no prophet in the Old Testament, no one, that you, you, you can pick your Bible up and go read through it and you'll see this. No one ever, no human being said, your sins are forgiven. No one had that authority. Listen to how people react to Jesus. Now I want you to, to listen to this reading carefully and hear how these scribes react. Scribes in that day and time are Bible scholars. These are the guys that know the text. They know the Old Testament. They know it well. They can quote it. So they are thinking, as Jesus is doing this, they're going to think some things that we need to pay attention to. This is Mark 2, 6 through 12. Now some of the scribes are sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? They're talking about Jesus saying, your sins are forgiven. He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them. So they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. So rightfully, the scribes go, now wait a minute. No one can do this but God. And the word here, this idea of questioning in their heart, in the Greek actually is where we get the word logic from. So, so just think they are really thinking deeply about this. They're searching their computer bank of their brains going, wait a minute. He's forgiven people's sins. Only God can do that. And what Jesus is claiming here, if we're, we'll miss it if we're not careful. Jesus is saying, I'm not just any regular guy. I'm not just some advisor for your life. I'm not just some guy that's going to give you stuff. It's bigger than that. C.S. Lewis has a famous argument. You've probably heard it before. It's called liar, lunatic, or Lord. And you need to pick one of those today. Because I think we make mistakes with Jesus. We domesticate Jesus. Either Jesus Christ was a liar about who he claimed to be. He claimed to be God among us. That's what he claimed. He does it all through the Gospels. If you read it like a first century Jew, that's what he's saying over and over again. I am God among you. He's either lying about that and he's a charlatan. And that's bad, actually. That disqualifies him from being a good teacher. Or he's crazy. He's a lunatic and you should feel sorry for him. Or the third option, which I believe to be true, and I can give you all kinds of reasons for that if you want to be here for a while. He is the Lord 
of the universe. He is the Lord over all. He is what you need. It is that simple. We make things so hard. It's that easy. You need Jesus to be Lord over every square inch of your life. It is not some advisor role. It's not just some person that's going to give me the things I want. He is Lord over everything. Here's this paralytic man standing before the author of life. And so he says, listen, what's easier to tell this guy his sins are forgiven or to tell him uh, to rise and walk? And actually, it's harder to say your sins are forgiven. So he just proves it says, okay, we'll get up and walk. I'll prove to you I have the authority to do this. Some of y'all may remember Heath Ledger, the great actor. He was a guy that had everything, it seemed like. He was a great actor. If you remember, he died tragically back around 2008. And Roger Friedman wrote this about Heath Ledger. He said, it's hard for the average movie fan, including yours truly, to totally grasp why a guy like Heath Ledger, drop-dead handsome, popular, incredibly talented, could be depressed about anything. And the answer is, you can have everything. You won't. You can have all the accolades, all the money, all the stuff. But without Jesus, you're going to be empty. Without Jesus, you will never be content. You will never have unshakable joy that could be never taken away from you. It's that easy for us. So we think in this story, Jesus heals this guy. And we know from Mark chapter 3, the ball starts rolling at this point. We're told that they decide at that moment they're going to kill Jesus. They're going to kill him because he's dangerous. And this following is growing, and they don't like it. They can't get control of him. And so we get a little glimpse of what's coming. That just three years from this story, Jesus Christ will be hanging on a cross. And Scripture tells us simply, really easy, he died for our sins. Now, as we start to think about our greatest need today, our greatest need, we realize that we have a problem. We realize that we are sinners in need of grace. We realize that we have sinned in our life, and we are going to die. Every one of us, we will die. It doesn't matter if you're Heath Ledger, Billy Joel, or or just some regular Joe living in Dothan, Alabama. We're all going to suffer the same fate. And there's only one person that has the answer to that problem, and it's Jesus Christ, who died for your sins Scripture says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross because he saw your salvation. That's his heart. That's who he is. He is the only person to go into death and successfully destroy death. And he says, I will do it for you too. So I want to tell you this today. If you're in Christ, you have something wonderful. Jesus says, one day he will come back and the dead will hear his voice and they will be raised. He will say, come forth to those in the grave. He's going to say, come forth, David. How awesome is that? One day, come forth, David. Come forth, Ansley. Come forth, Monty Ball. How awesome is that going to be? That day when the voice of Jesus Christ says to your name, come forth to everlasting life. So our greatest need I present to you today is Jesus Christ. It's that simple. He's not some advisor. He's not something we add to our life. He's not some person is just going to give us every wish of our heart. He should become Lord over every part of us. Now today, if you want to learn more about Jesus, you're not a Christian. You've not accepted this gift. We're doing things a little bit differently right now because of COVID. We will have a shepherd up here at the front at this table. If you want to learn about how to get this gift of Jesus, please, I implore you to come talk to one of them. Grab me, grab a staff member, grab someone. And learn more about this Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing our last song together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved. Oh!
remember who we serve. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this blessed privilege we've had to be here. Father, help us in our struggles each day of our life to be who we should be. Remember whose we are. Father, just you bless us each day of our lives and we're, we're such a blessed people. Help us to remember that. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus. It is through him that we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.